Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for today comes from the 10th chapter of St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, verses 23 through to 33. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's good. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience' sake. But if anyone says to you, This food was offered to idols, do not eat it, for the sake of the one who told you, for the conscience' sake. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I denounced for what I have given thanks for? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offence, either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all in all, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The famous Lutheran classical musicians, Johann Sebastian Bach, Georg Friedrich Handel, and Johann Christoph Graupner, used to sign off their works, Soli Dio Gloria, or in English, Glory to God Alone, to signify that their music was written to God's glory alone and not their own. God is the creator, saviour, and preserver of all. The earth is his, and all of its fullness. He is worthy to receive glory and honour and power, for he created all things, and by his will they exist and were created. God is worthy of all glory and praise. Scripture tells us time and time again that our whole lives are to give glory to God. Not just on Sunday, not just at church, but our whole life should be done in glory to God. In Romans chapter 12 verse 1, Paul says that our bodies should be presented as a living sacrifice to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20, Paul says to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 17, Paul says that whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11, Peter says that ministers should serve with the ability which God supplies, that all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. All glory belongs to God alone. And so as Paul said in today's reading, Do not seek your own profit, but whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. As we near the Reformation, I've been preaching through the solas, that is, the alones of the Reformation. And we have finally come to the last sola, soli dio gloria, or glory to God alone. But why do we give glory to God? Is it so he will look on us more favourably? No, the triune God is not like the so-called gods of the ancient pagan religions, which would reward worship with blessing. No, our God is a kind, loving, caring and generous God. He gives us whatever we need, whether we praise him or not. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 2 says that all things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good, clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 45, The Father makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God gives blessings to all people, Christian and non-Christian, those who praise him and those who ignore him. Jesus died on the cross for all. Of course, only those who believe in Christ will receive the benefits of his death, but the fact remains that Jesus died for everyone. 
We don't give glory to God because he will somehow reward us for it. No, we give glory to God because he deserves it. God is the creator, the saviour, and the protector of all mankind. We praise him in gratitude. We give the glory to God alone because he is the only one who deserves that glory. However, that is not the only reason we give glory to God. For while God is worthy of all glory, honour and praise, he doesn't need it. God is not starving for praise or glory. God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything from us. Instead, he gives us what we need without seeking or needing anything in return. Therefore, we give glory to God not for his need, but for the needs of those around us. Martin Luther said, God does not need my good works, but my neighbour does. Paul tells us that we are to do all things to the glory of God, not seeking our own profit, but the profit of others. Jesus says the greatest two commandments are to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The best way of loving and serving God is to love and serve your neighbor. As Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you have done to me. By serving our neighbor, We are serving God, and by giving glory to God in all that we do, we are profiting our neighbor so that they may be saved. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 16, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, for the profit of your neighbor. In regard to faith and life, Actions and practices can be divided into three categories. The first is those things that obtain God's wrath. Things like murder, adultery and theft. Those things that God has forbidden and promised to punish. The second is those things that obtain God's grace. Things like holy baptism, holy absolution and holy communion. Those things which God has commanded us to do and has promised to grant us his grace and the forgiveness of sins through. And the third is those things that God has neither commanded nor forbidden. Things that we are free to do which do not obtain God's wrath or God's grace. These things we call adiaphora. In regards to adiaphora, we are free in Christ. All these things are lawful to me. However... Just because you can do something, doesn't mean you should. As St. Paul said, All things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful to me, but not all things are edifying. We may be free to do certain things, but not everything we do is helpful, either for our sake or for the sake of those around us. Am I free to wear t-shirts and jeans while leading church instead of this alb? Yes. Are we free to replace the organ with electric guitars and drums? Yes. Are we free to replace the hymnal with altogether books or songs from Hillsong? Yes. Are we free to replace the candles and flowers with lasers and smoke machines? Yes. We are free in Christ to do all of these things. Nowhere in scripture are these things commanded or forbidden. They are all adiaphora. However... Not all things are helpful or edifying. We may be free to worship God how we choose, but there are certain things that will detract from a true worship of God and other things that will enhance our worship of God. There is an old Latin theological phrase from the 300s called Lex Orendi, Lex Credendi. This phrase literally translates to the law of prayer is the law of belief. Or a more simplified version would be How we worship shapes what we believe. As Christians, we are free to use whatever liturgy we want. However, there are certain things that are helpful and certain things that are not. How a church worships shapes the church's doctrine. The historical Christian liturgy that is practiced in our churches is called divine service. We call it this because in it God comes to us and serves us through word and sacrament. 
Our Sunday services are not about what we do for God, but about what he does for us. In this, God serves us and we respond in gratitude and our liturgy and our hymnody reflects that belief. Our Sunday service is structured in such a way that our focus is drawn to the word of God, given verbally in the readings and the sermons and given physically in the Lord's Supper. The preaching of the sermon and the reception of the Holy Communion are the pinnacles of our worship and the rest of our liturgy points to those pinnacles. And our hymnody focuses on God's work of salvation. It gives glory to God alone and not to man. However, much of contemporary worship is the exact opposite. To start with, contemporary worship is called a worship service or a praise service. They call it this because their focus is not on God's service of man, but on man's worship and praise and service to God. The songs, music and liturgy are all based on me and my service to God. Even their communion is not about God feeding us with his body and blood, but about me sharing myself with God. The songs are so me focused. Many of them literally use lines that are, I stand and lift up my hand. Lord, I praise you and I will sing praise. They are all about what I do for God. We may be free to use whatever liturgy we desire, but just because we can do something doesn't mean it's helpful. Pastor Evan Gagline of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod said concerning the liturgy, The question should not be, will it win more people over? The question should be, would this deliver Christ in a better way than it already does? And the parts of the liturgy are direct quotes from Holy Scripture, and I don't think you can improve upon the delivery of Christ from them. When doing something that is adiaphora, your thoughts should not be concerned with your own freedom, but whether or not it gives glory to God and whether or not it will profit your neighbor and their salvation. Paul was dealing with this very issue in Corinth. There was a question concerning whether or not Christians could or should eat meat sacrificed to idols. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Jesus has declared all foods clean and nothing is unclean in and of itself. The Christians were free to eat the meat. However, all things may be lawful, but not all things are helpful or edifying. Just because the Corinthians could eat the meat didn't necessarily mean that they should. Paul says that if you buy meat in a market, ask no questions and just eat it. And again, if you're invited to an unbeliever's place and he gives you meat, just eat it and ask no questions. However, if you are given meat and somebody says that this food was offered to idols, then you should refrain for the sake of your neighbor's conscience. Now, many of the Corinthians had objections to this. Why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Or in other words, why should I give up my freedom because of somebody else? And also, but if I partake with thanks, why am I denounced for what I have given thanks for? Or in other words, if I thank God for this food, then why should I be announced just because the food was offered to idols? Paul's response to all of this is, You may be free, but not all things are helpful or edifying. Do not seek your own, but seek the good of your neighbor. Be concerned for your neighbor's conscience. Paul says that we should refrain from eating the food for our neighbor's sake. He says, don't give offense to the Jews, to the Greeks, or to your fellow Christians. Instead, please all in all, not seeking your own profit, but their profit that they may be saved. Now, when Paul says, don't give offense and please all in all, he isn't saying that we need to be politically correct or that we need to watch our actions or words in case we might hurt somebody's feelings. No, Paul isn't saying that you need to give in to everyone and compromise to make them happy. Paul rejects that idea in Galatians 1.10 when he says, I do not seek to please men, but I am a servant of Christ. And in 1 Thessalonians 2.4 where he says, we speak not pleasing men, but God. Instead, Paul means that we should not give offense in regards to salvation. 
Our actions are to give glory to God and to point others to him, not to be a stumbling block to the faith. As David said in Psalm 69 verse 9, Let those who seek you, O God of Israel, not be confounded because of me. Do not let your actions be the cause that lead people away from God and his true word. Instead, let your actions be helpful and edifying. Let them point others to Jesus. Let your light shine so that others may glorify your Father in heaven. Earlier, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again lest I make my brother stumble. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. If an unbeliever gives you food, just eat it and don't ask any questions. For if you do, you may offend your host. But if somebody informs you that the food was offered to idols, don't eat it for in eating it you may offend somebody else. We can note that Paul does not mention who the informant is who said this food was offered to idols. But further on, Paul gives three examples of people who might be offended. Jews, Greeks and fellow Christians. Paul commented earlier in this letter that the food itself is fine for the idols are nothingness. And that whether we eat or not, we are no better or worse. However, he also states that What the Gentiles sacrificed to idols, they sacrificed to demons and not to God. And Paul does not want us to have fellowship with the demons. If we eat food that we know was sacrificed to idols, we give the outward appearance of having fellowship with that idol. And we ruin the integrity of our preaching and teaching. If a Jew were to see you, he would say, These Christians claim to worship the one true God, and yet they have fellowship with the idols. A Greek would say, you Christians claim to condemn these idols, and yet you have fellowship with them. Or a fellow Christian may say, how do I know that he is a true believer if he has fellowship with idols and demons? Paul says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. The table at which you eat gives the appearance of fellowship. It is for this reason that we practice closed communion. There are Lutherans around Australia and even the world who claim to be one in confession with us. Yet they commune at the altars of heterodox churches. As humans... We cannot search the hearts of men, and we can only make judgments based on outward actions. If a person communes in a heterodox church, this gives the appearance that they are in fellowship with those false teachings. They may claim to hold to true teachings, but their fellowship ruins the integrity of their message. As the famous Lutheran dogmatician Francis Pieper once said, It is self-evident that members of heterodox churches must sever their connection with the heterodox body and have declared their acceptance of the true doctrine before they may commune with our congregation. By giving an outward appearance of fellowship, you damage the integrity of the Christian message. It no longer appears that you are giving glory to God alone, but to the idols. A modern example of food sacrificed to idols is halal certification, which is done by many companies to show their support for Islam. Islam is a violent and false religion. Christians need to oppose this heresy, which not only harms the body through their acts of violence, but also the soul through their false teachings. If you are unaware of a product's halal certification, then eat it. The earth is the Lord and its fullness. All foods are clean. You are free to eat. However, if someone were to point out to you that the food is halal certified, then we should follow Paul's advice and we should refrain from eating the food, lest we appear to support Islam and thus jeopardize the Christian message. Now some of you may ask the same questions as the Corinthians. Why should my freedom and liberty be hindered? But before you ask such a question, stop and think for a moment. Is my concern for my neighbor's benefit or for my own freedom? I am not here to burden your conscience concerning halal certified foods. However, following the example of St. Paul, let me say this. 
You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of Allah. By knowingly eating halal certified foods, you give the outward appearance of supporting Islam and Sharia law. But by refraining, you show your contempt for this wicked religion of Islam. You display your devotion to God alone. And in turn, you strengthen the integrity of the Christian message. The food in and of itself is harmless. It is lawful for you to eat it. Thus, if someone presents you with a meal, eat it without asking questions. But if someone makes a point of telling you that it is halal certified, do not eat it for conscience sake. And when I say conscience, I mean not your conscience, but the conscience of others. You are free to eat the food, but remember, not all things are helpful or edifying. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do not seek your own liberty. Instead, seek the profit of your neighbor, that they may be saved. And whatever you do, give the glory to God alone. In doing so, you will point others to him who alone is their savior. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.